It's interesting that you mentioned feeding us because that's exactly what Jesus told him, right? Yeah. You love me, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. Feed my sheep. Amen. Well, good morning. This is uh, Pastor Mike Erickson from Big Bear Four Square Church. We're having a nice warm day in, in uh, Big Bear today. And uh, we're going to glorify the Lord. Today we're in a brand new book for us, Second Peter. And... Uh, the message this morning is called By His Divine Power from Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, that your word is always powerful. It always is spiritual. It speaks to us. It keeps us. It feeds us. It works on us. It sharpens us and takes the rough edges off and blesses us. So I pray, Lord, all those things would happen today. And God, I ask that you would use your word in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Peter. Well, this letter was probably written during to the Christians in Asia Minor, the same group that Peter wrote First Peter to. Uh, First Peter was written from Rome to those in that area, and Second Peter is uh, to stir up and refresh their memory. So, we think that 1 Peter was probably written around 64 AD. Some traditions say that Peter was martyred as early as 64, but I'm going to get into a little bit, that, a little bit of that later. But it seems reasonable to regard 2 Peter as written from Rome toward the end of Nero's reign in the year of Peter's death, which is 67, 68, and Nero's death was about 68 A.D. Nero is, we've been bringing up his name a lot. He's a huge player in the early church, and not for positive reasons, but under the theme of First and Second Peter about suffering and giving glory to God, waiting for the second coming and doing all these things. Uh, Nero, his name is Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. He was born in 37 AD and died in 68 AD at the age of 30. He was uh, Roman Empire for uh, 14 years, and he started as an emperor at 16. He's infamous for his cruelty. He ordered the murder of his mother, Grappina, and also of, he is married four times, and he took care of some of his mother-in-laws, and. Uh, people in government, and so he started off really, really well as an excellent emperor at age 16, but with every year after that, he started getting worse and worse, and uh, suffered under paranoia, and I think a lot of mental illnesses and things going on in him, and he felt threatened, and killed family and all those things a lot. So he ordered the murder of his mother, Agrippina, in 59. And he's just 18 at the time. And executed leading Romans. 
Uh, he was a favorite of the Roman legions in the Praetorium. He was a favorite among the common people. But the aristocrats and people of Rome at the time that really had political power in the Senate and all that, they were constant odds and, and there was poisoning at tables and different things happening and people were being executed. And, and for the aristocrats of the Roman government at the time, it was much like uh, North Korea today. You never knew if you were going to, this could be your last day. His reign witnessed a fire that destroyed half of Rome in 64 AD. And you know the famous thing about uh, fiddling on the roof and all that. Well, 64, he's about 26 years old. And he purposely set that fire so that he could pave a way for a construction of his new palace and an area. But the aristocratic people were against him doing the palace expansion. So Nero had uh, this fire started and burned the area where he wanted this new palace and then blamed it on the new small group in town called the Christians. And as a matter of fact, he included some of the Jews in that as well. And uh, so that started in 64, waves uh, uprising in 68, and led eventually to his flight from Rome and his eventual suicide. During this time in 66, he started the war with the Jews and they're called the, uh, the Jewish Wars. that lasted from 66 to 73, seven year period. And um, so he was part of that as well. Well, he initiated that as well. At age 16, like I said earlier, he became the fifth emperor of Rome. He was, from birth, it was known that he would probably succeed to the throne sometime. At first, his reign was peaceful and promising a good future. And it was uh, close to this time, from 61, 60, 61, around there, that Paul had appealed to Caesar in the book of Acts. When Paul says, I appeal to Caesar, it's to young Nero at the time. And so in 61, he's uh, 22, 23 years old. So the trial of Caesarea, and we can find that, Acts 25, 10, 11. So, and consequently, he had been brought to Rome to present his case in 61 AD. So we presume and assume, because we don't actually know that, but we assume that he went to trial and it was clear to all charges, and he actually stood before Nero. Nero being 21, 22, 20, around that, that age. Why do we think that that possibly happened? Because the angel of the Lord and the Lord himself told Paul, you must stand before Caesar and testify before, in Rome before, before me. So based upon the old words of the Lord, I'm assured that it was not passed by and something happened. But Paul, um, Paul was freed to resume his ministry, and he uses uh, freedom to travel extensively to a fourth missionary journey between the years of 62 and 67. During those years, 62 to 67, Peter likely came to Rome and wrote for us Peter in 64. 
but there's no evidence that Peter and Paul were in Rome together at any given point, except during the time just before they were executed in 67 to 68 at Mamertine Prison. So let's start off with verse 1. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. Before we get there, you must understand, being an emperor of Rome was not an easy job. Something that none of us would like to be a part of. As a matter of fact, is probably more like being the godfather of a mob family and where where you might not know you the fall the next day. Okay, verse one. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the, instead of justice, I would say righteousness and fairness of Jesus Christ and God our Savior. I believe that Peter is writing this just maybe months before he goes to his death. Simon Peter, his name expresses his whole life where he was an old man and a new man because Simon means unstable as sand, unstable as wheat. Uh, and even Jesus said, Simon, Simon, even though Satan desired to sift you as wheat, which is a play on his name, Simon. I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That was Simon, unstable. But Jesus said, no longer am I going to call you Simon, I'm going to call you Peter, which is a rock. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter became the rock of Pentecost that put the church on the map, fulfilling the, the prophecy of Jesus, saying, upon this rock, I will build my church. So it's taking a sandy, shifty guy and make him into a rock and rocky type guy. And so the very nature of the name Simon Peter shows us how God transforms a life, changes a life from Simon to Peter. I have a good friend in, uh, I think he's in Apple Valley, Ted Medina. And um, Ted was a vice president of the Hells Angels in San Bernardino. And he and Otto Freely, president of the Hells Angels in San Bernardino, and a bunch of other people came to Long Beach and got saved. Well, there one night there was a, about a year later, there was a uh, conference, pastor's conference, and a body of prophets and elders were laying hands on him. And this one prophet from Canada says, uh, says the Lord, You've been called a bird of prey, but tonight I change your name into that of an eagle. Well, the whole church freaked out. Uh, the prophet didn't know, know anything about this or about him. But his name in the world was Beautiful Buzzard. And the Holy Spirit, through the prophecy, changed his name from a bird of prey to that of eagle, changing him from beautiful buzzard to that of eagle. 
all the motorcycle shops, he invented the handlebars, like pullback handlebars. His poster is in shops and all that. Beautiful buzzard. What happened? God changed him from a bird of prey to an eagle. And Ted, if you're listening today, you bring glory to God, you're an eagle in God's presence. And we all freaked out thinking this little, this prophet from Canada who came in for these meetings had no way to know what God had done. Isn't that an amazing story? Amen. God changed you as well. Amen. Remember a story, God changed a man named Jacob and gave him the name Israel. Amen. You know, the thing about that name Jacob's surplanter, it also means heel grabber, but that it's a negative connotation. But when God changed his name to Israel, do you know that very few times, if just very few, maybe a couple, two or three, does, is Israel ever referred to Jacob by that name? Soon, Jacob, named Israel, given to that individual, becomes a nation. I mean, so what do you see with Jacob? You see the old man, and now you see the nation. Not just a, a, a guy with a new name, but the scripture says, just a few times calls him personally Israel because he becomes a nation. You know, so... I mean, God does the miraculous things, and Simon Peter is one of those. Amen. Now, the type of Peter, death that, by crucifixion that Peter was to face was predicted by Jesus in John chapter 21, verse 18 and 19. And like all people, the... John was with Peter when Jesus was saying, you, you know, you're going to be crucified, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. And Peter says, well, what about this guy? What about this guy? And Jesus says, well, if I, if I wanted to live until I come again, what's that to you? <clears throat> so Peter knew exactly that someday, sometime, somehow, he would be crucified, and that happened in 67 to 68. And in that process, he did not want to be crucified in the manner of the Lord, so they turned him upside down. Those who share precious faith as ours, to those who know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. You know, I want to say that if you're not growing in the faith, you're going to go. And I'll, bye-bye, I will see you. I'm sorry. But if you're not growing, you're going. If you're not pursuing your faith on a daily basis, we're, we're in the last days, the end times, and if you're not pursuing your faith on a daily basis, you're living in perilous times where you're going to be devoured by the roaring lion who's seeking for you. And don't put yourself on the menu. What do I need to do? Well, you need to fellowship. You need to pray. You need to worship. You read the word, devotionals. Get into the Word. Get close to the Lord. Somebody says, well, what should I do? Do it all. Do everything you can do. If you want your, to preserve your faith, you will want to stand for Jesus in the last days. 
make that happen. If you don't, if, if you think it's just going to be an automatic thing, it's going to happen. Well, we will not see you. How sad it is for me to say that and actually see that year after year, time after time, and there's nothing I can do about it except for to share the prophet's voice and say, please walk with Jesus. Please walk with the Lord. Seventeen hundred pastors every month quitting the pastoring. Some of them quitting the faith, buying into the lies of our day. Exchanging the God of heaven for the God of science, so-called science. You know, funny thing about science. In 1840s, we were having the first steam trains and trains, railroads all over America. And the trains were supposed to go an incredible 40 miles an hour. But all the scientists and experts says, well, if they go faster than 25, they're going to lose their breath, pass out, and die. So they were afraid at first to go past 25 miles an hour. Then they went to 30 and 40. And they said, guess what? We're not dead. All the scientists and experts and all these things, guess what? You're wrong. And we live in another stupid day like that. The knowledge that lifts itself up against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5. In the name of science. Who Romans chapter 1 says, what kind of fools are these that the Exchange the glory of God for something created by man. And don't listen to every, doc to every doctor phony on the planet. I mean, pseudoscience and this and that. Stick to the word. Stick to God. Amen. Stick to your faith. Know what you know. And don't get your God from YouTube, and don't get your God from History Channel, Discovery Channel, Idiot Channel, or anything else. Okay. Well, if I make a touchdown, you can get a thing of Gatorade and pour it over my head. Because a lot of Christians are buying into the deception that's happening through all the media, through all the, all the lies, all the pseudoscience and all this. We're losing people. Verse 2 says, But may God give you more. How many do you need more? Amen. And more grace. May God give you more and more grace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. This is the key for you. Well, Peter knows what he's talking about. He's about to be crucified under an insane little emperor named Nero who is not afraid to kill people and put them in, dip them in wax and hang them put him on fire in his garden. Not afraid to do the most cruel things. Peter's writing this and saying, now more God, may God give you more and more grace. You know, if you need this much grace, 
God's got that much more. Amen. You need grace to walk with God these days. I was sharing in Thursday morning Bible study our priorities. First one, our priority is God. The question is, why is God our first priority in a sense of conversation? I said, because we need to protect in our heart who he is, what his word says. We need to not compromise who, anything about God. And we got to put that a first priority. What I know about God's going to stay there. What I know about his word's going to stay there. God's given us more and more grace in our knowledge of him. Two ways you have knowledge. One by experience and the other by education. And our knowledge of Jesus Christ comes by experience with him and education in his word. Amen. Do what he tells you to do. Yeah. Find out who he is. Find out who wrote this book to you. And there's a lot of distortion of this book that's out there today. Why is it that people so get so excited about promoting false teaching? They do. The when the they get into it, oh, they're so excited about it. What happened? They never proved the word, the doctrine with the word. They just bought into that because it sounds great, and it's happening all the time. Verse three uh, is a key to my message. Title of my message: By His Divine Power. The word power here is dunamis, dynamite, dynamic, dunamis, power. You know, when, when, if you set off dynamite, guess what's happening? Things change. Mm -hmm. Real quick. Real quick. We use the word dynamic. Isn't that a dynamic whatever? Mm -hmm. We use that word. That's words is related here. God's power is actually powerful in us. A lot of things that we give ourselves credit for, in a sense, is God's dynamic power in our lives to, to take care of all the details. Amen. Power, dunamis, power, exousia. Exousia means authority like a badge or like a uniform, like a position of authority. God's given us both all those things by his divine power, by his divine exousia, by his divine dunamis. God has given you everything. Look at this word. God has given you everything, given us everything, we need for living a godly life. God has already in your spirit, by his spirit, by his grace, by his dunamis, by his exorcia, by his power, he's already given you everything. How much is everything? Everything. But what? But nothing, because he's given you everything that you need to live a godly life. So, if we don't live a godly life, it's not because he does, hasn't given it to us. He has.
And he tells us how we have been given everything by his power for living a godly life. He tells us how this works. He says, we have all received all this by coming to know him. If, any, if I could stir up anything in your heart today, it's pursue Jesus Christ with all your heart. Amen. Christianity is really simple, to know him. To know him. What do we have to do to know him? We have to talk to him as if we do know him. We have to get to know what he's like through his word. How do we have everything to live a godly life in this world under such people like Nero or crazy Senate that Rome had the day? And I mean, Peter is walking in times that you think. This is really bad. But for us, we have shadows of that happening right now. We have a taste of, of that happening right now. So how are you going to survive it? How are you going to live for God and live a godly life? By coming to the place where you come to know him more. Philippians chapter 3. I want to know him and to know him more. Not to just know about him, but to know him. By coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. God wants us to enjoy this life. I see that. John chapter 10 says, Jesus says, I've come to give you life and give you more abundantly, so enjoy life. And, but make your love pursue Jesus Christ. Who's the most important one in your life? Let your words come out of your mouth. My pursuit and love of Jesus. So God's power has been given to us so that we have everything we need to live a godly life. It comes by way of knowing him and knowing him more. But Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 and 20 Peter, Paul gives a prayer for the Ephesians that's very similar to the thoughts that we're looking at in 2 Peter today. Paul says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. So my prayer for you today as well, and for myself. Amen. That we'll understand the incredible greatness of God's power due to us for us who believe in him. No matter what happens to you, through the power of Jesus Christ, you win. There's no downside. God has got eternity waiting for you. God's got his blessings and everything now, right now, for you, waiting for you. Paul says, this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. That's pretty powerful. And seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms.
If you need more power, define what that power is and go to God and he'll give it to you. Amen. He will not give you power to pursue, pursue empty ambitions. He will not give you power to do your own thing apart from him. He will give you power and strength to serve and love him and pursue him. Verse 4. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human's desires. You want to escape the world's corruption? I, I do. I don't want anything to do with it. Talk about his great and precious promises given to us. Well, years ago as a young preacher, it was a lot of years ago I've heard Billy Graham preach this more than once and said that there were 30,000 promises in the Bible. Have you heard him say that? Yeah. <laughs> and so I repeated it in many of my sermons throughout the years, 30,000, until I found out there's only 31,000 verses in the Bible. So my, my great preacher was wrong. It happens. There are actually 7,487 promises in the Bible. 7,487 promises in the Bible. And of these 7,487 promises in the Bible, most comes with conditions of covenant. If you do this, what's the famous one we do for our country all the time? Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and confess confess their wickedness, then. I will heal their land. So a lot of the promises like that verse contain an if, conditions. If you do this, part of the covenant, the promise will come to pass and God will make it happen. So most come with conditions of covenant or obedience. If you obey me, then these are the type of things that will happen. You know, it's kind of, you're familiar with Deuteronomy 28? Mm -hmm. First 14 verses are all about the covenant blessings. Come on. The next 65 verses are all the covenant cursings if you don't do what's said in the first 14 verses. God's promises include a blessing and a curse, often based upon covenant, often based upon the if, often based upon obedience. And all the promises of God, 7,487, require faith. You love the old phrase, if God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Right. Requires faith. You could leave all the promises of God alone because you don't believe it, and uh, it's good for Pastor Tom, but not, you know, not for me. I mean, or you can believe and receive the promises that God's given you. Now, how do you know which promises God's given you? Well, when you're in fellowship with him and you read the logos of the word, a promise jumps out and becomes a rhema 
and you hear the voice of God in your spirit, and you can hear the voice of God and discern in such a way that he's speaking to you, and God says, I'm giving you that verse as a promise. And he's telling you in such a way that you understand it's the voice of God, whether it's subtle in your spirit or audible enough to shake the heavens, you heard from God. Then faith says, I will cling to that promise. I'm not going to give up that promise. I'm going to walk into that promise, and I will see the end fulfillment of that promise. And somebody says, well, what if it doesn't happen? Get behind me, Satan. I don't want to hear that. I'm standing on the promise because God has given me his word. I heard his voice in prayer. It's a word of God, a raiment for me, and that's what I'm standing on. Thank you. Requires faith, requires a prayer, requires requires patience in the process. How are you doing with patience? Patience including endurance, perseverance, long suffering. Patience is a wonderful thing, but it only comes through trials. It only comes through suffering. You know, when you say, uh, I'm patiently having my triple deck ice cream, and, and uh, that's not patience. <laughs> There's no suffering in it. In Romans 4.21, talking about Abraham, Abraham being fully persuaded. How's your persuasion? Fully persuaded. We're working on it. We're getting there. If you're at 75%, get to 80 today. But Abraham was fully persuaded that God had the dunamis, the power, to do what he had promised. Now, that's the easy part. You say, well, yeah, you know what? I totally believe, fully convinced that God has the power to do. The difficult part, we have to be fully convinced that God has the dunamis power to do for me what he promised me. Well, if it's God's will, it'll happen, you know, it's okay. Well, the thing about that is that if God's given you his promise and spoke his word to you, it is his will and he will fulfill it. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 22. Hang with me here. But as sure as God is faithful, he is faithful. You may not be so faithful, but he is. God cannot do a lot of things. He cannot be unfaithful. He cannot sin. He cannot be imperfect. He cannot be less than who he is. I mean, God, God is absolute. He's absolute truth. There's no lie in him. They say the things that God can't do. Absolutely. He cannot sin. He can't be imperfect. He can't be less than omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. He can't be anything else. Anything, anything else. You can't add to him. You can't subtract from him. God's all in all. So our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you even today by me and Silas and Timothy was not yes and no, but in him has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes 
absolutely in Christ. And so through him, the amen, everybody say amen. amen. Is spoken by us to the glory of God. There's no fault, there's no lie, there's no change, there's no misdirection when God speaks his promise and gives his promise to us. If he says, if you do this, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to uh, Barak, give my blessing to you. If he says that, you can say, yes, it's mine in Christ Jesus. It is the word of the Lord. And it will come to pass. We know what God wants for most things. And when he speaks those things to our heart, we cannot abandon the process at all, ever. Verse 21 and 22, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He's making you stand firm. He has anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us, on you, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing the promise, guaranteeing everything he said, guaranteeing for us what is to come. He sealed you in the forehead. It's the Holy Spirit has guaranteed you, put his deposit on you for what is to come. That's our salvation when he comes again. Don't fear the Antichrist being able to do anything to you because he can't put his 666 stamp on what God's already put there. He has no veto power. What God has promised you, do not let it go. If what, if what he's promised to you seems kind of far out to somebody, don't share with them so that they, you can hear the words, well, if God, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but if, what if. Don't, tell, don't share with the what if people. Share with the people of prayer, the people of promise, people who stand with you people of faith, people who will see with you the promises of God come to pass. Amen. That's why Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 7 of Matthew, don't cost, take your pearls and cast them before swine. Because if you do, they're going to take your little promises, trample them underfoot, and turn and tear you to pieces. <clears throat> Doctor gives you a bad report. You get a good report from the Lord. Amen. And you stand on the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5. We come against and demolish every argument and stronghold, every pretension that stands itself, raises its head against the knowledge of God, period. Mm -hmm. Father God, I want to thank you for my friends today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power in it. God, we will not let any of your word depart from our faith, from our heart, our mind, our spirit. And whatever you have promised to us, we stand on the promises of God. And we thank you for doing all those things in us and through us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much.